I've lived almost my entire life without a left hand. As a Paralympic swimmer, I rarely used a false one. But now I want to explore the world of prosthetics. Wow, this is incredible. From the pioneering cobbler whose genius stunned the medical world. He is the equivalent today of some of the most advanced companies working on prosthetics. The army colonel whose passion for photography led an X-ray revolution. You could see inside the body, you could see the individual bones. The reaction was almost one of total astonishment and the bedroom inventor making groundbreaking bionics. Ultimately, we want to make a bionic hand that really accurately mimics the movements of a human hand. Biotech inventors, past and present, are transforming lives for millions of disabled people. The one question I always get asked by young people is if you could go back and get your left hand back, would you? And I will always say no, because I believe it has made me the person I am today, a much stronger, resilient, and probably more successful person as a result of it. I'm a former Paralympic swimmer for Great Britain. But when I was four, I actually hated swimming. I had this real fear of deep water. I didn't float. I just remember pretty much sinking to the bottom of the pool. I did eventually get the hang of it. Over a 10-year swimming career. I picked up silver and bronze at the World Championships in 2009. I still swim, and today I'm back in Bath at the pool where I trained. Grinding out the lengths day after day. When I'm not in the pool, I'm in front of the camera as a sports reporter. Yes, you can expect another busy day here in Rio as Dame Sarah Story hopes to finish these games the way she started, going for a third goal. And I've taken up road cycling with plans for a long-distance challenge later this year. I'm hoping to do it fitted with a brand new hand to replace the one I lost when I was two years old. I'm heading to the University of the West of England. The campus is home to Europe's biggest robotics research centre and a hub for tech innovators. This revolutionary bionic hand is made from plastic using a 3D printer. Daniel Melville is the hand's chief tester. Growing up, I had a lot of the uh, bog standard prosthetics, as I call them, and unfortunately, didn't really do anything for me. It made me, in my own eyes, it made me feel more disabled because they were so chunky and people could tell straight away it was a prosthetic. And I stopped getting them after years. I only really ever got them so I could have time off school. But this, when I'm wearing this one, people don't come up to me and go, what happened to your hand? They're more like, whoa, this can't be real. Well, I'm quite blown away by just the look of it, but can you just show us some of the movements yeah, of, of, of what it can do? I have actually been testing other arms since the very beginning, but this one is my favorite one. So this is me opening and closing it. So yeah, people would come up to me and go, whoa, this is incredible. Dan's prosthetic is modelled on the lead character of the massively popular game Deus Ex. When we met, obviously, I haven't got a left hand and you haven't got mm. a right hand, so yeah. kind of shaking hands was quite difficult. But with this, I guess it solves your problem because yeah. everyone goes in for a right hand shake, don't they? So. You've solved that straight away. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. It's like the simplest thing. When you meet someone, the last thing you want is that awkward, like, oh, gosh, sorry, uh, yeah. what should we do? I was always that guy that, because I was left-handed, was like, oh, hello. <laughs> or I go, sorry, I'm a hugger, not a shaker. So yeah. I just give them a hug. But yeah, wearing this, it's a really positive feeling for me. Yeah. So not only am I shaking their hand, but I'm giving them a handshake from an arm from a video game, which is pretty incredible. It's a world away from the basic electric arm I used to have. Dan's awesome bionic hand first started life in the bedroom of inventor Joel Gibbard. The new things about this are that the fingers are independently actuated, yeah. which is it's probably different from the one that you would have tried. Yeah, mine was just a complete is, unit moving together, yeah. The way that Dan operates it is that there are sensors, electromyographical sensors, yeah, yeah. where you flex your muscles to activate a, an electronic signal that controls the hand. The control system is supposed to be as intuitive as possible, really easy to use. 
Open Bionics was launched in 2014 by Joel and co-founder Samantha Payne. The company has won a whole host of awards for its innovative, highly stylized and individual prosthetics. <laughs> the arms are all bespoke. The part of the design that's individual to the user is mainly the, the component that makes it fit properly to them. So the mechanics, the electronics, they're all the same each time. Yeah. The aesthetic cover yeah. over the top, they can choose what they want, so you can take it off and change for a different design in the future if you decide that you want, maybe you have one design for day-to-day -day going to work and then another one when you want to go out. Joel and his colleagues are making their designs open source, freely available for others to adapt and modify. So what we want to do is try and advance this technology as quickly as possible and as broadly as possible. Um, and we feel like this is a really good way to, to do it and engage lots of different academic minds from all over the world. And it's all about being affordable as well, isn't it? We use 3D printing for the manufacture, so that's one of the really big things to improve the cost, because you have one tool that can make anything. Mm. Ultimately, we want to make a bionic hand that really accurately mimics the uh, movements of a human hand, so we want to take it to that technological level. I'm blown away by Daniel's 3D printed hand. At £3,000, it's quite incredible. Perhaps these guys could make one for me. I'm a country girl brought up with my sisters on the family farm near Bristol. I was always an inquisitive child, messing with things that I shouldn't. The shiny machine in my granny's kitchen certainly looked like a fun toy to play with. I was two years old and I managed to put my left hand into a working sausage machine and my hand got cut off. I don't remember it to be particularly painful. I don't remember seeing blood or anything around. I just remember it being a moment where something was going wrong and I couldn't do anything about it and something long-term had happened. And for Mum and Dad, the memory of that day is still raw. How it all unfolded, I think it was Hannah's first week at school. I, I know the day, it was October the 9th, and your mum just found out on the morning that you had the accident, she was expecting Millie as well. I think my main worry was that Hannah had to be picked up from school at half past three, and I couldn't remember, it was three o'clock. Uh, it was the days before mobile phones, I was out on the farm, and I could just hear you calling, not really screaming, but I could tell there was something wrong. But So from myself coming into the situation and seeing you, um, in mum's arms and just saying that I've lost my hand and then me just looking at a stump that was, um, that was, uh, that was a great shock for me because all mm. of a sudden you think, well, actually, there's no turning back on that. I can remember, it, we need to get the hand into some ice, we need to freeze it. And at that point, your granny went out and got a bag of peas and I think we got the hand out of the machine. To my surprise, you were just no you tears. Even there crying. was no tears. Or... And you just were very charming. You said, I've lost my hand and we're going to go to hospital and get it mended. I think it's amazing. It's obviously they couldn't really... save my hand, so I learned to adapt and do things differently to my sisters and friends. <laughs> It was a pain having a clammy prosthetic hand fitted over my stump, but I coped, because that's what you do when you're a kid. I used my prosthetic hand in the early years, being able to do all those little things that you want to do at school and at playgroup. But as I moved into secondary school, I was starting to take part in, in more sport. And the prosthetic hands that I had, they were almost dangerous, because if the way I'm running around, they would almost start falling off and hitting people, and they weren't sport friendly. It wasn't something I was dependent on anymore, and that's where I guess the full-time use of my prosthetic came to an end. Early artificial limbs were basic and uncomfortable. Achieving a perfect fit is the holy grail of prosthetics. The first man to find it, a cobbler from Chard. James Gillingham was an ordinary shoemaker and he put his craftsmanship to good use and created this leather limb, which is just incredible because this was back in 1866, so he was way ahead of his time. In the mid-1800s, Chard in Somerset was a thriving hub of entrepreneurs, philanthropists and inventors. 
It was here that Gillingham's creative genius first stunned the medical world. Hi. Hi, Kate. Nice to meet you. I'm Amanda Broom. Hiya. Welcome to Child Museum. Oh, I'd like to take you into the barn to show you the Gillingham exhibition that we have. Wow, look and at this. In particular, this is where we have the prosthetic limbs. So this has been created by James Gillingham. The story really started in 1863 when the Prince of Wales was being married and towns across the country were celebrating, as you can imagine, and there were fireworks and there were cannon being fired. And in Chardy had a gentleman who was a groundskeeper up at Cricket St Thomas, Will Singleton. He was priming a cannon. Very unfortunately, the cannon backfired and the rod caught his arm and he actually had to have the whole of his arm amputated. His employer was desperate to try and see what they could do. They scoured the countryside and they couldn't find anyone to help him. At the time, prosthetics were still incredibly basic. Ordinary working men like Will Singleton had to make do with a wooden peg leg or an arm with a hook. A few years later, he just happened to be going into James Gillingham's shop, the Golden Boot in Chard. Now, what James did, and we can show you on this one here, because he was a bootmaker, he had a special technique where he would soften the leather first by moulding it. With that, he also accommodated things like straps, so not only would it fit properly, it would then be very supportive on the, on the person's body. What's incredible is that he'd picked up straight away James Gillingham that the fit was so important. For Will, it was an absolute success. He was then able to lift weights of up to 700 pounds. He was able to wheel a barrow. He was able to work with spades and with forks. And of course, it meant he could keep his livelihood as well. Gillingham's prosthetic arm for Will Singleton was so successful that other patients came from across the country. This is an example of some of his other work, isn't it? So this is the artificial legs that he used to create. As word spread about the work that he was doing, he was then called upon to do more different kinds of prosthetic limbs. The shoemaker from Chard was a keen amateur photographer. These extraordinary staged photographs showcase his skills as a master craftsman and surgical mechanist. Gillingham's detailed studies of almost every patient appeared in The Lancet and other leading medical journals. Sometimes there's a feeling that has been historically with medicine that medicine is something that's done to you. But in certain respects, as we advance in medicine, it's something that's done with you. And what we have here is a man that understands that from his work. He is the equivalent today of some of the most advanced companies working on prosthetics. Gillingham was summoned to the War Office, who invited him to make prosthetic limbs for injured British servicemen returning home from war. If you were a, a war veteran today, if you were someone who had um, had an amputation, if you were someone who was born with a, a particular uh, medical need, we would always think about that as something that we have to do bespoke. And Gillingham is the man who created a sense of entrepreneurship, innovation and bespoke. Gillingham's reputation as a self-styled surgical mechanist continued to grow. A stream of patients would arrive at Prospect House just off Charles High Street to be fitted with their bespoke leather limbs by Gillingham and his team. The current owner is John King. This is the workshop. This is where I used to make all of the limbs to in here. All of your staff. Yeah. Ten employees in here. Wow. There used to be a big shaft running through the top there and all the machinery. And they wouldn't have had any of this machinery that you've got, got here, would they? No, They're most of it was just like an anvil or snips and hammers just to dress it all around. This is the original bench there still. Wow. And Gillingham would store his patient's prosthetic limbs in the cellar. When I came down here, we used to be... 10 or 12 years out of me and my mate, because his father or his uncle worked down here. And there was limbs hung all around the place, and all the old prosthetic limbs and everything. How many do you think there were? It must have been a 50 or 60 at least. Wow. And what made you want to come down? What, what was the curiosity? Just to be nosy, <laughs> as young boys do. We looked around and had a good look, and we didn't hang around down there for too long. We scurried back up because it was a bit spooky. By 1910, the records show Gillingham had provided prosthetics for 15,000 people. So I'm intrigued by this. This is 
the price list for what Gillingham offered. Is yes, that right? that's right, yeah. And such a variation. I, I originally just thought it was arms and legs, but clearly there's so much to it. It's for hip instruments and, and back instruments. It wasn't just for amputees. No, and, and that's what you can see from his work. He did actually think of everything that the person may well have needed. Now, there is one thing on here that really caught my attention, and that's the Scrotum Trust, the Gillingham Scrotum Trust. He was so proud of it, he put his name to it. What might that be? <laughs> I'm afraid I really don't know. We could, we could make lots of different guesses about it, but I don't know. Do you think it's where maybe the modern-day box might have come from, a bit of protection in that, that area? It may well be. I don't think we have any here in the museum, though. <laughs> After James Gillingham's death in 1924, the business went into slow decline. The very sad thing was that as more and more people needed them, especially after the Second World War, what we saw was prosthetic limbs started to be built and mass-produced in the likes of America because, of course, they could do them much cheaper. So all of this work that went into making them bespoke and very special for people was lost. Gillingham of Chard finally closed in the 1960s. These are X-ray images of my left arm stump. And it's X-rays that first brought another child inventor and pioneer to national prominence. Straight after the accident, they weren't sure if I'd lost my wrist or if I'd lost my forearm or how it was going to grow. I'd actually cut out the growth plates of my, my left hand and that has massively affected the prosthetics that I use because my left arm has never grown any longer. And it was thanks to X-rays that revealed that. X-ray pioneer James Gifford was an army colonel and owner of a prosperous lace mill. Incredibly, he was a contemporary and near neighbour of James Gillingham. From his photographic studio and laboratory at Oakland's, Gifford's first X-ray images astounded the medical world. He was a, I suppose you'd call him a, a man of means. He had a private laboratory and he could develop his interests. Um, interests, particularly in x-rays, came out of photography. What he starts out doing is being very interested in lenses. And of course, lenses are the key to 20th century x-ray technology. We can start to look inside the human body in the most fascinating ways. You had to be good at photography to do the early x-ray work. And in fact, x-rays were called the new photography. This remarkable image of a woman's hand, most likely Gifford's wife, was among the very first to be seen in Britain. The technology at the time of Gifford was essentially the same as the technology in the end, towards the end of the 1960s. In other words, X-rays work because you have an X-ray tube which produces X-rays. These go through the patient and produce an image on a screen. In January 1896, he staged the first public demonstration of the new X-ray technology at the Royal Photographic Society in London. The reaction was almost one of total astonishment. The apparatus was not very powerful, but produced really very exciting images. You could see inside the body, you could see the individual bones, you could see the joints. Prior to that, to look inside the body was really very difficult. It was really how far you could reach with a finger. You know, you only really saw bones in the body before either on the battlefield or in, in, in the graveyard, the operating theatre, and there was a certain sense of the macabre about this. With his x-rays, Gifford led a medical revolution that continues to this day. The science of radiography now covers the very latest fluoroscopy, CT and MRI scanning technologies. Now x-rays can really show a huge amount of detail. If someone now, say, has abdominal pain, they will end up having an ultrasound or a CT scan. We can have modern and minimally invasive treatment only because you have non-invasive diagnosis. You know, today, if anyone's ever had a, um, an MRI scan, it is extraordinary what you can actually see uh, inside yourself. So this is the beginning of a, of a visual journey right across the 20th century. And this person, James Gifford, is very much part of that story. James Gifford never lost his love of science and invention. He was still doing X-ray work for local doctors in Chard until a few weeks before his death in 1930. This is it. They're on the beach, plunging waist deep into the sea. And
D-Day, 1944. World War II is at a critical moment. For seven-year-old Clodagh Whedon of Somerset, it was the day she received her first prosthetic leg at Queen Mary's Hospital, Roehampton, on the outskirts of London. In Roehampton, they had quite a big limb-fitting centre because the chaps were coming back from D-Day and everything. And I loved it as a little girl because I was spoiled by them all, you know. <laughs> and I saw Mrs Churchill and gave her a bouquet. And she said, please walk for me, and I walked for her. But no, it was. It was lovely there. You were spoiled. Clodagh's wartime leg wasn't a bespoke Gillingham leather limb, but a mass-produced one. 70 years on and several legs later, she still has a problem with the fit. This is your most yes, yes. recent leg, isn't it? Well, you it? see, now I just push my leg in. I've got socks on, like, you know, to push it in. But in the old days, you see, you had that. And then I had a strap come up there, mm -hmm. you know, to tie it up. And it would make you quite sore because, you know, that would hurt sometimes. And then a strap around. Mm. That was the early days. Well, I feel pleased now. This one is yeah. very good. It's very, and it's, it's very lifelike, isn't it? Yeah, it is. More and more. Yeah. I, this is, if you take that one, I'll show you show you mine. So this is obviously the prosthetic <laughs> hand similar, version. Very similar, Very similar in yeah. the kind of the yeah. socket and the, the look of it. Yeah. They don't do freckles, though, unfortunately, no. to match my skin. No, but no. You never know. I could always ask. But, but it is quite amazing when you look back at the pictures of Gillingham and then to this, but yeah. he must have so heavily influenced that idea of it. But now they do working. electronic ones, don't they? Yeah. You know, I never... At 17, I don't know if you felt that, or I got a little bit stressed at a younger age. I didn't think anyone would want to marry me. Do you? That's exactly how I felt, actually. Did you? Yeah, I always thought they wouldn't like me because I was a bit different. I know. And there's yeah. plenty of other people there and, with all their limbs. And the thing of it is... I used to think, well, how could anybody love me if I get into bed and put my leg off? And, yeah. You know, things like that. So. But what I found, it does help you filter through the rubbish. Yeah, you know? yeah. Are you actually... going to get married or not? Oh, one day, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> You're as bad as my grandma. She keeps telling him where's the room. <laughs> my boyfriend Chris likes to see himself as a modern-day innovator, very much in the spirit of Gillingham and Gifford. Hi. Hey, you all right? What are you up to? Just finishing off the tape on your, um, your bike. So almost done for you to use it. I've started picking up other sports again. I've really started to enjoy my cycling and I'm going on a ride from London to Paris. And I've realised I do need my prosthetic hand to help me. Yeah, okay. all nice and smooth on there. So I think that should be able to grip on there quite nicely. Because that's all sorted now after you've done all the adaptions. What, what have you actually done? Right, have you so changed it? We've got it now, so you, when you brake, both um, the front and the rear brake come on, thanks to this little shifty gadget here. Yeah. Um, so that put both the cables into one, bring it out to brake. We've also changed, put your... Um, a gear lever at the front. So all of my controls is now on the right It's all on the right, right hand side, side, so you can use it all your right hand. I've always cycled with with only one set of brakes and one set of gears, haven't I? Yeah, well, it's because I originally thought that um, it would probably be better with a, a mountain bike set up with a flat bar. Yeah. But um, obviously you're a bit vain and wanted to look cool on the road bike, <laughs> so we had to get the road bike handlebars. That's amazing. Thanks very much. Good job. I need to start using a more advanced prosthetic hand. I'd really like to investigate what is now available to me. And when I look around and I see all these amazing technological developments in prosthetics, I think, am I missing out? It's been more than a decade since my last NHS prosthetics appointment. Today, I'm meeting my new consultant. Hiya. Hi there. Good morning, Kate. You. My name is Alan. I'm a prosthetist. So here. what's on offer for us sporty types? I've got lots of different challenges in mind that I'd love to do, so okay. I'm cycling from yep. London to Paris. Uh -huh. Suddenly not having a left hand has become a bit of uh -huh. an issue, so I've been using this one. So this used to have a glove on it, didn't it? Yes. That used to look like one of these. <laughs> it used really to have a glove it, yeah, on. So. I adapted it slightly, so I've got, like, 
drilled some holes in it because it was getting a bit sweaty. You, you I took, well, yeah. took the heavy parts uh -huh. out and so now it literally just um, sits on my bike. Obviously we never like advise this. for people to adapt their own arms yeah, but sorry. the fact is that you managed to get using uh, it which is great. We've got this uh, adaption here and, and this is purely for, for bike riding this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the important thing with, with bike riding is that you have to be able to have a secure fit Yeah. but you also have to be able to get easy it off release. easy as well. So, so that is one option really. Yeah. Um, the other option would be something like this as well. So that's more for a road bike where you have this permanently attached to the handlebar. Yeah. This is on your arm. You can then use that for a push and pull there with that as well. And cosmetic considerations, does that come into it at all for you? I'm more about the efficiency of efficiency, it. Efficiency, yeah. yeah, yeah. If, it, if it does the job that I need to do, I'm not too worried how lifelike it looks. My disability has is, is got me to where I am and I don't really want to hide no. that. I think it's become cool to have a prosthetic. I have got many friends who have got missing legs and they consciously wear shorts. And people look at them in awe. That guy is, is taking on the world and has got some amazing things to help him do it. The world of prosthetics is advancing beyond all recognition. With Joel Gibbard and his team leading the charge, for the first time, they'll be working with children on a groundbreaking trial in partnership with the NHS. So the, these bionic hands have never been made for kids as young as 10 years old before. So with this trial, we're collecting data on how well it works, what they think of it, how they um, respond to the, the cool designs and with what's really a piece of wearable technology. I'm keen to get involved with testing their bionic hands. Joel sets to work with a 3D scan of my arm. So I just need to move around in all uh, planes and dimensions. The next time you come down, we'll make a little socket and just see how it fits. Within seconds, we have a result. There we go. That's it. I can't do it my arm. <laughs> how long does that take? If we just want to print something to see how well it fits, we can probably do it in an hour of design time. Gifford and Gillingham would have been astounded at what Joel can achieve using a mobile phone and a 3D printer. Geek chic for a mass market. You can find out more about this and other inventions from across the UK at bbc.co.uk forward slash tomorrow's world. I've been moved and inspired by what I've seen, and I'm excited to share what I've discovered with my family. The West as, a, as an area has become quite a centre of prosthetics and development. Your... So this guy that I met, he's got this, like, black style prosthetic, which has got all of that like, leathery sort of skin and it opens full hand and closes again. So he hard. says it changes people because when they come over, they're like, oh my God, look at your arm, that's amazing. Tell me about it. Today's biotech innovations owe a massive debt to the past. Gillingham, Gifford and Gibbard, 150 years between them, but a shared goal. We would never be where we are today if it wasn't thanks to inventors and creators back then that had the, the vision and the desire to help people, because that's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs>